happen. Hebrews chapter 10, let's begin reading together. Hebrews 10, I want to read verse 25, verse 25. And by the way, we have a lot of visitors this morning. Thank you for coming. I don't want to overlook you. But let's read together in Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is a familiar verse of scripture for many of us. This scripture has been used for many years and it has been used many times to shame people who skip church. You know, you don't come to church, you're forsaking the assembly. You don't come to church, you're, you're breaking Hebrews 10, 25. You're skipping church, you're forsaking the assembly and you need to come to the assembly. You don't need to skip church. That's not what this passage is about. That is not what this passage is about. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want you to skip church. I don't want you to miss the assembly. When we assemble together as the people of God, it is important that we do that. It is important that we all participate in the assembly of God. That's important because, as this verse tells us, that we encourage one another when we come together as God's people. If you back up and look at verse 24, it says that we need to consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. I need to give consideration to you how I can make you a greater servant of Jesus Christ. And I want you to give that consideration to me. And one of the ways that we do that as the people of God is by assembling together. Assembling is important. But that's not what this passage is about. Look in verse 25 again, where it says, not forsaking the assembling together. Forsaking. What does forsaking mean? You missed one service? You, you, you missed a few services? No, uh, forsaking is the idea of abandoning, Right? If you say to, 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 uh, to, to your boyfriend who has just broken your heart by breaking up with you, you say, you have forsaken me, you have abandoned me. I have this great love for you, but you've left me. That's the idea. You see, in this chapter, if you look, oh, let's see, about verse 32, it says, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, that is after you became Christians, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. You see, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish believers, Jewish Christians, people who came out of Judaism, they became followers of Jesus Christ, and when they did that, life got hard. They started enduring persecutions. People were mistreating them. In fact, in this chapter, it says that people were taking their possessions, taking their property, and they were being abused because of their newfound religion. And so the Hebrew people were, were tempted to say, you know what, none of this was happening to us when we were Jews. Why don't we just give up this whole Christianity thing and go back to Judaism? Life would be a lot easier if we did that. And so the Hebrew writer says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't abandon the assembly of God's people. Don't turn away from Jesus Christ. Don't turn away from the people of Christ. You see, this passage is more about just skipping church. You with me? Now, I want us to think about another aspect of this passage, though. You see, oftentimes we look at this and we say, hey, you need to come to church. You need to come to church. You need to be at church. When the doors are open, you need to be at church. And that's true. But rather than launching from this passage to think about the people who maybe skip church, I want us to, to turn it around and think about the people who don't. You know, there are some of us, there are many of us, there are many of God's people all over the world whose habit is not to miss church, but it's to be present. You know, surely there were Christians then in the first century, just as there are today, whose regular habit, the habit of some, to use the expression in verse 25, whose regular habit is to be there, not to not be there, not to be absent, but to be present. 
And so there are many Christians who have been regular in their attendance for years, three times a week. If it's during a gospel meeting, we're there every night. If it's bad weather, we're present. Holidays, we're there. If we're traveling on vacation or maybe traveling for work, we are going to meet with the saints of God wherever it is we are traveling. Why? If for some reason one of our worship periods was canceled, as was the case not long ago when we had that bathroom renovation, how many of you didn't come back to evening services because we didn't have an evening service, but how many of you were sitting at home at 6 o'clock and you kind of felt weird? You ever do that? You get into the habit of going to worship, and then for some reason if there is no worship and your habit is broken, you're kind of like, man, what do I do on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock? I mean, I've never had to deal with this before. What am I supposed to do? Like sit down and read a book or something? You know, we don't know what to do with ourselves because our habit is to be at worship year after year, week after week, three times a week, thousands upon thousands of sermons and classes, innumerable Lord's Supper observances. The question I want us to consider this morning as we think about all of this worship that we've been participating in is what have we gained from it? If it has been our habit and our custom to be present time after time after time, what have we gotten out of it? What have we gained from worship? Now, If you're not someone who is in the habit of being present at worship that often, listen, I'm not going to beat you over the head with a stick, okay? But here's what I am going to say. This sermon is for you, even though I'm kind of focusing more on the regular habit of uh, of worship. I want you to listen to what I'm saying this morning because there are things to be gained from regular worship habits. So I've got five things I'm going to share with you very quickly this morning. We're going to go through these these five things very fast. What have we gained from worship? Well, let me suggest to you, number one, that worship has kept us close to the Lord. It has kept us close to the Lord. Worship regularly makes us lift up our eyes to heaven. It reminds us that earth is not all that there is. And so as people who habitually worship God. We have become a people who pray on a regular basis. We have become a people who have internalized, we have memorized the hymns that we sing because we've been singing them for years. How many of you could have sung Victory in Jesus without the screen? Why? Because worship has been a habit for us. There are passages of scripture that we have internalized, that we have memorized because we have read them in our Bibles. We have heard preachers refer to them on numerous occasions. In fact, I probably could have stood up this morning and said, somebody stand up and tell me what Hebrews 10 25 says. And somebody could have stood up and done it. I guarantee you Wilbur White could have stood up and done that. We've internalized these things. We have come to know and love these hymns and these passages. We have come to know God. We have come to understand Him in a better way. We have learned to love Him more and more, and our love for Him grows with time. Our consciences, our our compasses have been affected and have been directed by God's Word because we have heard that word again and again. I think about Psalm 119 and verse 11, where where the psalmist said, your word I have treasured in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Are you still opening your Bible to Hebrews 10? When I think about this idea of staying close to the Lord, I think about several passages in Hebrews. But look with me at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 9. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see the contrast in these verses? Now remember the background of the book of Hebrews. Jewish people who had come out of Judaism, 
People who were familiar with the law of Moses, people who knew the feasts, they knew the sacrifices, they knew all the prescriptions for worship. And the Hebrew writer says, on the day of atonement, one day per year, the high priest and only the high priest could go into the presence of God and he would offer this sacrifice first for his own sins and the sins of his family, and then he would offer a sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation, but only the high priest could go into the presence of God. And the Hebrew writer says that there's an important contrast here. You see, Jesus is the high priest of the new covenant, and he offered himself as a sacrifice, not some lamb, not the blood of an animal, but he offered his own blood. And Jesus has gone into the presence of God and he has torn down that veil, opening up access for all people to God. And so the Hebrew writer says, let us, let all of us draw near to God. And what I'm suggesting to you in this first point is that worship keeps us closer to God. And that is possible because of what Jesus has done. Let me suggest to you, number two, that we have gained from worship a greater spiritual depth. A greater spiritual depth. And I mean both in our knowledge and in our character. Our knowledge of Scripture has increased with all of this regular worship that we have been a part of. We have insights into the message of Scripture, and that insight has gotten deeper and deeper through the years. The Bible for us has become a daily companion. We read from it every day. We meditate upon it regularly. We have a good grasp of what the Bible is all about. If you don't have a good grasp of what the Bible is all about, come to my class on Wednesday nights. We are learning the story of Scripture and how the Bible fits together. And when you open up your Bible, you've got things underlined and highlighted and the pages are wrinkled because you have worn that book slap out. And worship has encouraged us in that. And all this knowledge that we have gained, it has had great consequences upon our character as the people of God. Be turning to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read a passage there in just a moment. But as you turn there, be thinking about your thoughts and your words that you speak on a daily basis. All of that has been affected by our worship because we have been encouraged and reminded that we need to be people of the book. And so as we have learned more and more about God's word, we have applied that teaching to our lives. We have applied it to other people's lives when they come and ask for our advice or our wisdom. We give them advice from a spiritual perspective. Charles Spurgeon once said, quote, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. I love that. When a Bible is falling apart, that means it's been well used. And if you are well using your Bible, your life is not falling apart. Now, I know we get blindsided at times and things come into our lives and, and shake us. But it gives us a foundation upon which to build. Colossians chapter 1, look with me at verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask, now here's what Paul is praying for the Colossians, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Why? Why do you need this knowledge? Well, look at verse 10. So that... You will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You want to gain knowledge so that it will affect your character and then your character will be producing good fruit so that you will then increase even more in your knowledge. So God's word has affected every aspect of our lives. And that's what it was designed to do. And so we have become a people of greater spiritual depth. Number three, we have come to know and love our church family. You know, when you get together with the same people three times a week, you get to know each other pretty well. You get to learn things about each other. And, and we, we form strong friendships together. I'm still somewhat new here, 
but many of you have been worshiping together for decades. And you remember each other's babies, and you remember the weddings, and you remember the funerals of loved ones. We have laughed together. We have cried together. We have been victorious together as the people of God, but we have also at times suffered defeat together. We would rather spend time with our brethren than just about anybody else on this earth. Isn't that true? I know that's true for me. We share a bond together that transcends everything on this earth. I think about what Jesus said, and you don't have to turn there, but Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, you remember that rich young ruler who wouldn't leave his possessions, he wouldn't give up everything and become a follower of Jesus? And then right after the story of that rich young ruler, you have Peter who stands up and he says to Jesus, he says, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And that was not an exaggeration. Look at Luke chapter 5, where Jesus goes to them and he says, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Uh, Peter and, and, and the others, they have just hauled in this massive catch of fish that they could probably sell for a pretty good amount of money. And yet Luke chapter 5 says they just left the net and the fish sitting there on the shore and they became followers of Jesus. It says they left everything and they followed Jesus. They truly did that. But I love the response that Jesus gives. And in Mark 10, 29 and 30, Jesus says, There is no one who has left houses and farms and brothers and sisters and mothers and children for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold of the same. What that passage tells me is that it's possible that my church family becomes even closer to me than my flesh and blood. But that's the way Jesus designed it. I look out over this assembly this morning, and you know what I see? I see brothers and sisters, and I see children who, who are my children, even though they're not mine. I see your children, and I love your children, and you love my children. And I see parents and, and grandparents, and I see some of you great-grandparents, but I see family connections because we're the people of God and we share a bond that is heavenly in its nature. And our regular worship together, our regular being together has made us appreciate that more and more. Number four, worship has taught us respect for the will of God. Every time we assemble together as the people of God, and we go through what we sometimes call the acts of worship, the actions of worship. And we usually talk about five of them. And I don't have any problem with that. But when we come together as the people of God and we engage in these activities of worship, worship reminds us that God in His Word has spoken to us and He has told us how he wants to be worshipped. And so when we come together three times a week and we engage in these activities together and we do it the same way time after time, why do we do it the same way time after time? Why do we repeat the same patterns of worship? We do that because we can open our Bibles and we can say, this is how God says he wants it done. And so when we come together as the people of God and we engage in these activities of worship, we are reminded that this is what God said he wants us to do. And so it serves as a regular reminder, this is why we do what we do. This is why we do this. That is why we do not do that. We can point to scripture and say, I know what the will of God on this is. And this is why we're doing it this way. And I feel confident about that. And so we understand that these things that we do together, this is not Church of Christ tradition. You know, it, it, the, the reason that we don't have a piano sitting up here, it's not because just churches of Christ just don't do that. Well, I mean, there's some truth to that, right? Why doesn't the church do that? It's not because we're opposed to pianos. In fact, I love listening to piano music. And if any of you are good at piano, you can come serenade me anytime you want. I love listening to pianos. I love listening to guitars. I love all kinds of music. But see, the reason we don't worship with instruments of music, it's more fundamental than that. It's not just a matter of preference. It's because we look into Scripture 
And we don't see New Testament Christians worshiping with instruments. And so it's a principled stand that we're taking, not a preferential stand. And so we seek to follow Scripture because we're reminded of what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13 when he said to Timothy, hold fast to the pattern of sound teaching. We understand that God is a God who has given patterns in his teaching. That's been true for centuries. For thousands of years, God has said to his people, this is what I want. And so when we come together and we sing the way that we sing, Every single time. When we come together and we observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week and we do it the same way every single time, why don't we change it? Is it because we're just a bunch of fuddy-duddies and sticks in the mud who don't like change? No. It's because we respect the will of God. We respect what God has revealed to us on these subjects and regular worship habits remind us of that. Finally, number five, Regular worship has helped us long for God more and more. It has helped us long to go home to be with God more and more. Each worship period is a foretaste of heaven where we will be worshiping Almighty God forever, where we will be praising the Lamb forever for what He has done for us. I think this fact helps us as we consider mortality, as we consider death. Death is not a bad thing for us, folks. It's the best thing for us. Do we understand that? It is the best thing for us. And I know it's hard. I know we, we struggle to see our loved ones pass. But when we are the people of God, death is something that ought to make us rejoice. It is something that should make us happy because it means we get to go be with Jesus. It means we get to go home and to be with God and the angels and all of God's redeemed throughout eternity. And worship has helped us long for home. We know that our worship on earth will always fall short of what it's going to be in eternity. For those of you who just feel like you cannot carry a tune in a bucket, you know, that won't be true in heaven. You're going to have the voice of an angel. Our worship on earth, it's sometimes feeble, and it falls short. And we recognize that. That's just the human frailty within us. But even with our feeble and frail worship that we offer to God, that worship can be so powerful and so moving at times, right? But how much more when we get there? How much more when we get to go home? Can I? Remember when I said it can't be close to the Lord and I said that there are hymns that we know by heart that we remember? Well, you know, I think that the hymns that we know by heart that we remember And regular worship helps us more and more long to be with Jesus. So, what have we gained from worship? I think we've gained a lot. I think there are many benefits that come from regular worship habits. There may be more than these that we've discussed this morning. But thank you for listening. I hope the lesson's been helpful. Thank you for joining me in that song. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian... We invite you to become one and then begin participating in these regular worship habits that will be so good for your soul and so powerful for your daily life. If we can help you this morning in some spiritual way, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.